need to test it or? Yeah. Good morning. This is just a little test. Not much is happening. Okay. Good morning. Um, thanks for coming at this uh, at the early session here at the IGF. We have a few um, technical problems, but we will just go ahead. So, transcript is not working right now. Um, can you hear me well? Thanks. Okay, my name is uh, Tim Engelhardt. I work uh, at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. My focus is on human rights in the digital age, and um, I work uh, a lot on, on privacy issues. And uh, so it's quite natural that we want to address today some privacy issues. And with me here is a, a wonderful um, group of experts, and I'm very grateful that they agreed to come. Um, just to my left, um, Emily uh, Um she is the head of the Public Affairs Department here at the um, Commission Nationale de l'Informatique et des Libertés, the French uh, Data Protection Authority. Um, next to her, uh, it's Lola Scheilen, um, advisor of the Democracy, Transparency and Digital Rights Unit at the, the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. Next to her, Graham Webster, fellow and coordinating editor of uh, Digi China of uh, New America. Um, Wafa Ben Asin, um, the Middle East and North Africa policy lead of Access Now. And uh, finally, um, last but not least, and I'm really immensely grateful that she's here today because uh, we had a little hiccup and I asked her this morning um, to replace um, Malavika Jarayam is um, Smitha Krishna Prasad, the Associate Director of the Center for Communication Governance at National Law University Delhi, an eminent expert on privacy. I um, wanted to start just with a few words on, on, on the work of the office uh, on, on, on privacy issues, and uh, then focus on, on one particular field of issues uh, around biometrics. Um, in our work on, on human rights online, obviously privacy is a core topic. Um, the first bigger wave in the last uh, few years of, of, of our work started with um, the Snowden revelations in 2013 to a report um, on the right to privacy in the digital age in 2004, which um, set quite influential standards, and in particular when it comes to government surveillance and communications interception. But the Things have moved on ever since. Um, 2015, the Human Rights Council created, as many of you know probably, um, the mandate of a special rapporteur on the right to privacy. And um, 
this year has really she seen a, a, a shift of, uh, of focus on, 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 on new topics, both in the, in the real world and uh, in our work. Um, we had Cambridge Analytica, we had the, um, the GDPR, the um, General um, Data Protection Regulation in the European Union coming into effect, all very influential, and in September this year, the High Commissioner for Human Rights presented to the Human Rights Council a new comprehensive report on the right to privacy in the digital age. Um, in parallel, you may have heard about the Secretary General um, having developed a comprehensive, comprehensive strategy on um, issues around um, digital and emerging technologies um, where privacy um, plays a core role. And also within uh, numerous, uh, within the UN system, between many offices, agencies, etc. Um, we have developed a set of quite fundamental principles that we intend to develop into policies uh, in the future. Just a few words about the report, and then we will move on to um, our experts. Um, the report um, adds to uh, as I mentioned before, um, adds a new dimension um, f away from uh, from a government s surveillance uh, focused approach um, without abandoning it and looks more closely in, at new developments of technology, um, data driven technologies, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, etc. Uh, internet of, uh, of, of things uh, related issues and um, raises concerns that are connected to this ever growing digital footprint of everyone. Um, and based on that, the report um, develops um, fundamental standards regarding the responsibility of business enterprises, the duties of states to protect against interferences uh, um, by third party actors, as well as uh, of course to respect and promote um, the right to privacy um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a state actor. And um, based on that, we, um, we came up with a set of, of, of minimum standards, we would say, for a legal framework we think is uh, necessary both for regulating um, states and business enterprises. Um, and one particular trend um, the report identifies is, is an is a growing reliance on biometric uh, information of all kinds for the identification of um, individuals um, by states, by businesses. And um, we see this as a trend that really needs to, requires close attention because of the sensitivity of, um, of biometric data. Um, so I want to um, transition now to, to our discussion around uh, biometric data and I ask um, Lee next to me to, to set the frame to describe a little bit what kind of uh, data we are talking about, what kind of standards uh, the French uh, Data Protection Authority sees um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to take part in this, in this event. Uh, thank you for your introduction and a brief summary of uh, the um, Human Rights Report. 
Um, just a few words to, to begin. Uh, the subjects uh, selected for this round table demonstrates how through technological development, biometric data have become a key element of identification and authentication processes and must be subject to a particular attention from a data protection and privacy point of view. Indeed, biometrics can bring change in a legal model. Biometrics enters our daily life. For example, biometric data could be used for administrative, public, or law enforcement, but also for domestic or private purposes. For example, to unlock your mobile phone, to access a banking app, to open your car, etc. In the European Union, um, the GDPR addresses specifically biometric data and provides for definition. Biometric data is a personal data resulting from specific technical processing relating to the physical, physiological, or behavioral characteristics of a natural person which allow or confirm the unique identification of that natural person, such as facial images, for example, or dactyloscopic data. More specifically, the European Union regulation considers biometric data as a special category of data. And it's really important because it's a special category of data together with, for example, data revealing racial or ethnic origin, uh, political opinions, etc. And uh, this um, special type of category of data lays down as a general principle uh, of the prohibition of processing with this data. The GDPR then specifies what the exemption to the prohibition principle are. We could mention, among others, the explicit consent of the data subject, the legal obligations in the fields of employment, social security, or social protection, the protection of the vital interests of the data subjects. Even when processing of special categories of personal data, such as biometric data, is allowed as an exemption, all other obligations derived from the GDPR will apply. And in particular, privacy by design and by default, the security of processing and the data protection impact assessment. These are essential obligations to ensure the lawfulness and safety of biometric data processing. Finally, member states are entitled to maintain or impose further conditions, including limitations, in respect of biometric data. At national level, the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, is applying by law since, uh, for 14 uh, years ago, provision related to the processing of biometric data, firstly relying on a prior authorization and dedicated safeguard, and has in 2016 updated uh, its referential uh, to take account of the latest development with two single authorization processes of this type of category of data. Generally speaking, the processing of biometric data can produce benefits for people, as for example, make identification and authentication procedures easy, fast, and convenient, improvement of user experience, ensure safety, etc but also some risks, as for example, lead to a gradual loss of privacy, 
if no adequate safe goals are implemented, risk linked to the misuse of the biometric data, etc. In this context, the main principles of the doctrine of the French DPA are the individual's control over his biometric data and data minimization. The CNIL also specifies the necessary requirement for the domestic use of biometric data, such as mobile, mobile phone verification or application access. In these cases, um, the use of this um, tap type of data um, is allowed uh, for private and individual use only. The use of such process must be optional and, the of, um, and of the sole decision of the data subject. The biometric template must be stored in the device in a dedicated and autonomous space, not accessible remotely. So not, um, not remote storage on cloud or external server. The biometric template must be also protected by state-of-art encryption. In an e-government context, the opportunity to implement such processing is strictly defined by the law. We need to have a legal basis to process this type of data. The processes is on behalf of the state, acting in the exercise of its prerogative of public power, and data must be strictly necessary to the authentication or to check the identity of individuals. These requirements also, re also respond to the upcoming application of the principle of privacy by design and by default, as per the European Union regulation and could be used as a model to consider the development of common standards on the processing of biometric data at international level. Indeed, in the 21st century, the protection of data security and fundamental rights requires a global response. Technological developments ranging from biometric identification to big data to artificial intelligence offer nations and corporations an unprecedented capacity uh, for uh, surveillance of individuals. This common standard on the processing of biometric data at international level would respond to an intangible fact when it comes biometric identification, regardless of the country legal framework or con constitutional order, biometric data are unique identifiers of a person and contrary to password, which can be changed if compromised, this is not the case for a person fingerprint or facial image. In this context, data protection authority are on the front line of, develop of developing safeguards and standards, shaping technological change and creating norms to protect privacy in the modern age. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I think that would, will help our discussion. And um, may I ask Lola to jump in? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I will just be presenting a case study from South Africa on how um, the use of biometrics, which was intention, uh, intended to actually give effect to human rights, was eventually misused in the manner that then led to the violation of rights. So over 10 years ago, the South African government established the South African Social Security Agency, basically to help in distribution of social grants to um, beneficiaries, over 17 million beneficiaries we currently have in South Africa now. Um, and so because there was a lot of corruption in the system, 
then biometrics was introduced to try and curb that, and that actually led to um, a lot of savings. Um, hundreds of thousands of, of rand were saved in the process. But the problem then arose when in 2012, um, Sasa entered into a contract with um, this um, company to help in distributing the social grants. What then happened was that, um, so this country, this company is called CPS, um, and it was, it was a subsidiary of a main company called NetOne. So now NetOne was a huge company that provided a lot of financial services uh, in South Africa from insurance to um, um, even had a bank on its own and also had things like um, providing um, um, cell phone data and stuff like that to, 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 to citizens. So then the, gov the constitutional court found out the process for um, getting the contract by CPS was invalid and illegal and decided that it was going to sort of suspend the, um, the contract. But, but because of the impact it will have on social grant beneficiaries, that invalidity was suspended pending when um, the whole situation could be rectified and a new contract is entered into. But what then happened was that the contract persisted for six and a half years. Um, and in the process, the biometric data of, of the social grant beneficiaries was compromised. So let me try and explain what happened. Um, so the thing was that using a social grant system, you could get your funds in two ways. It's either you open a normal bank account, um, as you will normally do, or you get a, a SASA card. And with that, you can then withdraw your money at a cash point or at an, at an ATM. Um, so what then happened was that um, maybe I should use the case of a particular um, um, beneficiary as an example so that you can understand how it works. So there was this lady called um, Serena Fauci. She was a single mother, had four kids, didn't have any job. So she then received a grant um, for her four kids of about a, a thousand rand a month. Um, and then obviously that wasn't enough for her to make ends meet, so she wanted to get more, um, t take out a loan. So she went to um, a subsidiary of, of CPS, Moneyline, and they said to her, you know what, to actually get a loan from us, you need to open up this new bank account by one of their subsidiaries. And then they used her biometric data to verify her information that she was actually a social grant beneficiary. As part of that process, they said to her, you can't get this loan unless you take out a, an insurance policy, which is actually against the law. What happened at the end of the day was that at the end of the month, she would have all sorts of deductions from her social grant and would be left with like 50 rand out, out of 1,000 rand every month. Um, to the point where for Christmas, she apparently had only 40 rand in her bank in, in the SASA card and could not actually have any money to support her family. So she was very desperate. In essence, um, CPS used the biometric data it had in terms of the access to the SASA um, system and share that information with all its subsidiaries to be able to then use that to attract you know, um, some of the vulnerable, most vulnerable in society. In essence, what happened was that they preyed um, on these people and kept them in a perpetual cycle of indebtedness. Um, and so because of what was happening, a lot of CSOs um, spotted this issue and were very active, took the case to court, and uh, a lot of things have changed. So as of last mm -hmm. month, CPS is no longer involved in the process, but I, I think the damage has been done. Um, and so what they've resorted to doing now is to try and influence beneficiaries to then open an account using their bank, the EPS, and then through that be able to then control how the funds come through and deduct funds. SASA has now had a new process working with the post office in South Africa, and they now have new cards where you cannot actually deduct anything from, 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 the, bank, from, the, from the grant beneficiaries. Um, and so a continuing concern really is about the information that CPS has had access to all this while. Um, the Minister of Social Development has announced that CPS has, had agreed to return all the information it had. And there's meant to be an audit process to make sure that that happens. But the, with the way CPS has worked over the last six and a half years, nobody really trusts that they have done that or they will do that. So it really remains to be seen if um, it can be verified that they don't have any more access to the biometric data. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, the point is that it really was the vigilance of CSO organizations who litigated and con conducted a lot of advocacy. Um, and that was the only reason why this was stopped. Were it not for organizations like Black Sash and Section 27, I believe that um, CPS would, would have continued to make um, a huge profit. So they were already making a huge profit from, from um, 
from the contract they had. Just to give you an example, they were on an average distributing about 14, 14 billion rand a month. And because of what they were able to do with the biometrics, they were able to get about 500 or 600 million of that amount back to their various subsidiaries that were preying on social grant beneficiaries. So, I, and that in a nutshell is, is the um, experience in South Africa with biometrics. So, not to say that it's all bad, because, like I said, it has saved the government a lot of money in trying to root out corruption. But at the same time, um, this case shows the kind of um, um, dangers that lurk, you know, when you tend to use biometrics to even for um, giving effect to a human right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, Graham um, will give us uh, some insights of uh, cases he has looked into. Thank you. Well, um, so I come to this table as um, an editor and organizer of a project where we, um, we work to understand uh, tech policy in China um, from a number of angles with the specific notion that there's a lot of good information out there in Chinese, but not much in English. So um, I, I come uh, with a number of things in my mind that are uh, thanks to the work of our community of uh, volunteer translators and analysts. Um, and uh, I just want to appreciate that first. Um, uh, it's it's the, the DigiChina project that um, everybody's been building have, has made it possible to do a, a great amount of analysis that I think um, we wouldn't have been able to do. So just wanted to put that thank you to our community out there first. Um, but for today, I want to start a little bit broadly um, with the uh, emerging personal information protection regime in China, um, go into a few specific uh, areas of biometric use in China, and then I have a couple of uh, recommendations that I'll uh, bring up and, and we'll see what we have time for. Um, but there's a, basically in the international conversation about privacy in China, it's become a trope in recent years that Chinese people simply do not care about privacy um, and therefore companies can exploit uh, user data for profit in a way that um, in some narratives provides a competitive advantage. The reality is unsurprisingly uh, more complicated um, and we see a fairly significant um, strong looking but largely untested um, emerging regime of laws, regulations, standards, and other regulatory documents uh, pertaining to privacy and personal information protection. The core uh, feature of this regime, like in some other countries, is that uh, companies and sort of everyday government agencies or other handlers of personal information uh, incur significant obligations in terms of the type of consent that they must gain to collect uh, personal information um, and the way that it's stored, protected, handled, and in some cases processed. Um, the cybersecurity law of China, uh, which came out, uh, went into effect last year, uh, has significant content on this. There are uh, there are rules and procedures for privacy impact assessments that uh, provide guidelines both for private sector actors and for public sector actors uh, in terms of how systems that are new should handle personal information. Um, there's a personal information protection law that has long been in the works um, and may be picking up uh, in the next few years. Um, and significantly for this context, there is a non-binding but still very forceful uh, personal information security specification that has been issued by cyberspace authorities in China uh, 
that will look very familiar in places to people who have studied the GDPR in Europe um, and, some, and, and really does draw some of its inspiration um, from major international conversations about privacy and personal information protection. So I note that to say that in this specification, which as I say is non-binding but still has been used for enforcement, um, among both, they have two categories, one is personal information and one is sensitive personal information, and both contain uh, the same list of biometrics that are to be uh, focused on. Genetic data, fingerprints, voice prints, palm prints, uh, the unique shape of your ear, irises, and facial recognition features. And as is helpful in many Chinese uh, regulatory documents, there's an et cetera in there. So um, they want you to keep, keep in mind uh, that there are other biometrics out there. Specifying these biometrics um, implies a higher degree of scrutiny on how, uh, in this case, consent is collected and what can be done with those data. Throughout all of this, there are enormous, just huge exemptions for national security uh, and law enforcement purposes. So while, um, for instance, the Social Security Authority um, might have significant uh, data protection requirements, uh, if you get into the state security, national security, uh, and police area, uh, it's going to be significantly less restricted and very opaque. So just a couple of examples of technologies uh, in biometrics and how they're uh, deployed in China. Um, public security authorities have been making use of the existing national ID card database, which includes photographs of everyone who has an ID card, which is most people. Um, and there have been widely, you know, a lot of media reports about specific uh, local uh, uses of this data. So at the annual beer festival in Qingdao, uh, as with some other public events, facial recognition was used to identify uh, criminal suspects. I'm not sure if this is with the National ID database or with other photographs. Um, facial recognition is also used in some reported cases at the entryway to apartment buildings, essentially for the security of the building. Facial recognition is used uh, to identify jaywalkers in some cities whose uh, identities may be uh, broadcast on a billboard uh, in a sort of name and shame effort to decrease the instance of jaywalking for public safety and traffic concerns. Um, and in general, in major cities at least, surveillance cameras are omnipresent in China. They're just constant presence. Um, although it's generally unclear how many of them are still working, what type of systems they're connected to, these types of information are not uh, widely available. And you, you never quite know where the cameras are going. So when it comes to the government use of these data, the regulations around retention of information from, for instance, a large event like the beer festival or a sports event, um, or retention of data if you're using facial recognition at the front door of an apartment building. Um, these rules and how the data would be protected are not totally clear. I'll talk about one more uh, area, um, DNA collection um, and genetic data uh, collection. So there are a number of different national efforts in China to collect uh, genetic information. Um, it, they come in two major buckets that I think address two uh, contrasting public purposes. One is widely reported um, by both journalists and human rights organizations that uh, police organizations are developing a national database uh, of DNA. Um, and as the Wall Street Journal has reported, uh, DNA have re routinely been gathered from people detained for violations such as forgetting to carry identity cards or writing blogs critical of the state. 
Human Rights Watch also has last year reported that biometrics, including DNA, fingerprints, iris scans, and blood types are being collected in a widespread manner uh, in the Xinjiang region uh, where there is a, a real uh, apparent human rights emergency uh, in the way that the Chinese state is detaining and otherwise treating uh, predominantly Uyghur Muslims. The DNA collection has a less law enforcement or security uh, angle in a, a national effort to develop a DNA database for scientific reasons. Um, Chinese companies are some of the global leaders in rapid uh, genome sequencing. Um, and there's a great scientific uh, application for, develop, uh, for building these large databases that can be analyzed uh, for medical research purposes. At this point, I think I'll hold off uh, on recommendations. I do, and I think we're going to talk about some of that later. Um, but I want to end with one observation, which is that something that you see in the Chinese data protection discourse is a recognition that the very large amount of data collected by private actors, by government actors um, in the country uh, produce a national resource that can be harnessed for good purposes and also create security concerns. Now one can assign their sense of what a good purpose is in different ways, um, but the notion of a risk in holding these data is very important. Um, and I think that as you observe the proliferation of databases, in, including biometrics, whether it's facial recognition, you know, we all wear that on our face, um, or DNA, which is collected through more laborious means, it seems unlikely that some of these large databases will not be uh, breached. We likely will be living in a world where uh, large numbers of people have these sort of unique identifiers out there uh, in the world, and I think that's something that we, we ought to keep in mind as we both develop best practices to avoid that type of outcome um, and plan for uh, unfortunate future incidents. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, Smith, do you, do you want to jump in now? Thank you. Um, thanks, Tim. So, uh, I think uh, I'm going to give you give a brief overview of the the system that we have in India, the biometric identity system that we have in India. And I think um, when we were talking about South Africa, a lot of the the you know there were a lot of similar points made. Um, so the biometric system in India, the identity system in India is called um, Aadhaar, and this project started almost a decade ago in 2009. Um, and it was a very simple idea when it started. It was meant to be uh, to provide a way to verify the identity of individuals who didn't have existing ID. So not everyone has a passport or a driving license. Um, it was meant to uh, provide all of these people with identification and use this identification uh, to verify whether or not they are meant to receive government subsidies um, and welfare, um, welfare services in the, in the Indian government. Um, and it's an interesting case because uh, so a lo lo lot of the social welfare schemes in India, um, as opposed to many other countries, uh, aim to provide actual goods and services to individuals who are uh, beneficiaries of these schemes. So for example, if um, somebody will get, you know, Act, uh, food distribution in the form of like they will get X kgs of rice and lentils and um, things like that rather than just get a direct transfer of the equivalent amount of money into their bank accounts. Uh, and providing ben, uh, welfare services in this form meant that there was a lot of corruption, there were a lot of people siphoning off the, the, uh, the food and the other um, goods that these people were meant to uh, obtain. Uh, and Having a di like a digital, unique, biometric-based identity system was supposed to ca take care of this and make sure that only those people who um, deserved or were, um, uh, you know, under the law required to be given these welfare uh, subsidies got, uh, obtained them. Um, so 
this unique biometric based identity number is called Aadhaar and it was meant to be very easy to obtain. You just had to go and give, um, enroll for the number by giving your uh, demographic details, your name, your age, your address and also your biometric details which was fingerprints initially and I think now also includes your iris scans but the, um, the law allows for any biometric information to be collected. It's not limited to these two. Um, and the interesting thing uh, in this case was that while the project started in 2009, we only had a, an actual law come into effect to govern this project in 2016. And even that has been criticized heavily for uh, not really taking care of uh, data protection and privacy issues, among other things. Mm -hmm. And all of this, we have to remember, also happened while um, uh, India still does not have a comprehensive data protection law. Um, so there was a bit of a vacuum there on to in the context of privacy. Um, so in the meantime, while between 2009 and 2016, and since then also, a couple of different things happened. One is that uh, there was a case filed before the Supreme Court of India challenging the constitutionality of the Aadhaar project itself, like the entire project, as well as many specific uh, aspects of it, including uh, the idea that the, the right to privacy of individuals is infringed uh, by this project. Um, the other big issue was that uh, the biometric data was stored in centralized databases and there was a big security concern uh, in terms of the data of individuals but also na like a national security concern associated with this. Um, but at the same time, uh, the use of this biometric ID number was expanded greatly. So it was no longer restricted to uh, welfare uh, and subsidies. It was uh, used for everything that you could think of, every government uh, service that was provided, but also many, many private services. So you needed uh, another number to uh, get a bank account, you needed it for healthcare services, you needed it for your subsidies, you needed it for a phone number. Uh, and they started asking for these numbers, you know, to, to enroll children in school, like primary school, secondary school, colleges. Um, so while under the law and on paper, the scheme was voluntary and the number was, the data was supposed to be provided with consent and uh, uh, it was, you know, effectively quite, ma it was mandatory and it became very difficult to really function in India and obtain any services without uh, having an Aadhaar number. Um, and this, happened while the Supreme Court continuously issued interim orders saying that you cannot make it mandatory for uh, government services. So uh, there was, I mean, there was a lot of discussion and debate in India about how, uh, what happens next, wh uh, what is going on with Aadhaar. And, um, you know, of course, the government also said that there's a lot of savings that they're getting because of Aadhaar, so it's a good thing. It's, uh, we shouldn't restrict uh, the use of technology to improve our governance services. Um, and... Earlier this year, we finally, the Supreme Court, after about five years, I think, uh, issued a judgment on this system. Um, so they did uphold the constitutionality of the Aadhaar system. They said that it is valid. It's not an illegal system in itself. Uh, but they have cut down its scope substantially. Um, so now the government can only mandate the use of Aadhaar for um, services that qualify as subsidies. That's a much narrower definition than was used uh, in practice, um, and private companies can no longer use Aadhaar, so your banks, uh, your private banks, your telcos cannot ask you for an Aadhaar number to, um, to provide you with whatever services they need to. Um, but it's interesting because at the same time, it continues to effectively be mandatory because the Supreme Court upheld the law that requires you to link your Aadhaar number with your income tax returns, and everyone in the country is required to file an income tax return irrespective of whether they earn an income or not. Or, and um, at the same time, the people who are probably below that range of income who will be filing actual returns will pro possibly need subsidies. So, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to see who would be exempt from this at this point. Um, but I think the big takeaway from all this is that the, the process that was followed, because when we had, when the system was introduced in 2009 as a much simpler project, there was no law in place, it was an executive order. And then the law came into place in 2016 without much public debate or consultation on what the law should actually say. 
Um, and now we're in a situation where if private actors cannot use our Aadhaar uh, numbers, and if the government is also cannot use it for many of the services that they have already collected and started using your Aadhaar uh, number for, uh, we now have to sit down and figure out who has the number, who has the information associated with the number, the biometric information associated with the number, who has what range of that, and then what they need to do with it. Uh, if they're not allowed to use it anymore, do they need to delete it? Uh, you know, do they, how, how will they show us that they've deleted this number? Uh, what happens next is a big question. Um, so I think the big takeaway is that we need, it would have been much simpler if, we, if there were processes, like better processes followed legally uh, from the onset of the system. So I'll stop there and then maybe we can discuss it. Thank you. And uh, Wafa, I think, has another um, intriguing example. Hi. So I think our session ends in 10 minutes. So uh, <laughs> we don't have much time to discuss the recommendations. So I'll also kind of delve into that right after the case study. But I just wanted to provide yet one more example of the usage of biometric data. So we often mention biometric data when we talk about digital identity programs. But sometimes they're also used for other types of programs, such as um, elections. Uh, so uh, the Council of Representatives in Iraq had an election last year in 2000, and actually 2018 is this year still, uh, in May, and uh, the Independent High Electoral Commission in Iraq decided to use an ele ele electronic voting system that integrates the usage of the collection of biometric data to authenticate identity. And so um, in April, prior to the elections, the commission itself launched a campaign that was called Your Car Today is Your Voice Tomorrow to push a full adoption of this biometric card technology in the electronic voting system. Uh, and they particularly pushed it with local universities uh, that supported the campaign to encourage the younger generation to subscribe and to register for the elections. Um, the official rationale, of course, for using biometric data to vote was that uh, doing so prevents fraud and improves the accuracy of the voter list. So what this meant in practical terms is that the Electoral Commission would prepare special electronic biometric cards containing a chip, and then the voters' personal data would be stored on that chip. Ironically, only days after the election, the Prime Minister announced that there had been serious attempts at fraud and falsification of results, which was the very thing that the Commission was trying to steer away from by using biometric voting cards. Um, and so the Iraqi Parliament ordered a manual recount of all of the ballots, and fired the Electoral Commission members who oversaw the process. It was a board of nine members. The issue is that until this day, we actually don't know what was done with that biometric information, where it's stored, what, was, what happened to it, what was made of it later. And uh, we also don't know what steps will be taken to keep the personal and sensitive data of all of these voters uh, protected, private, and secured. That being said, um, I wanted to perhaps go through a few recommendations on the governance of biometric data, so not necessarily cybersecurity, as my colleague Emily mentioned at the beginning, or privacy. Um, so first, authorities must ensure a defined and restricted scope for the usage of a program that incorporates biometric data, and this needs to be provided for in the law. Uh, lawmakers must explicitly and clearly define the purpose of the program, and that the government or the authorities that are integrating these types of data must clearly explain the scope of application and use to the public. Second, governments should ensure that providing biometric identifiers is voluntary, I believe as one of my colleagues also mentioned, and also opt-in, and that is not, it's not just a default security measure. Uh, individuals must not be compelled to provide identifiers and they must uh, voluntarily opt-in to share identifiers that can, and this must not be made a precondition for the provision of services or to vote or for you being a citizen. Um, third, when conceptualizing or designing these types of programs, governments must also create independent and well-designed mechanisms for grievance and redress. So individuals should have appropriate mechanisms to seek redress related to abuse or misuse of their personal data, as well as taking into consideration the possibility of data breaches or hacks. To that end, public authorities uh, should keep detailed logs whenever an officer accesses retained data, and uh, public authorities must also document and retain records detailing the purpose of such access, the purpose and scope as well. So what was accessed and what was it accessed for? 
Fourth, uh, legal procedures and evidentiary standards for biometrics should also be developed with care to protect human rights and due process. So for instance, when biometrics are used in criminal identification, the physical evidence should be retained and used as a primary source of identification. In law enforcement's use of biometric data from consumer devices, for example, for like, from like an iPhone, uh, should be greatly minimized. Biometric information collect by, collected by private parties must be recognized as protected information, subject to uh, the appropriate legal standards that are required for such data under the necessary and proportionate principles internationally, but also especially under uh, relevant domestic law. And finally, my last point is that authorities should undertake transparent, inclusive, open processes for consultation whenever they initiate any proposal that integrates biometric data. Because this is, as my colleagues mentioned in the past, this is information that one, cannot be changed, and two, it's, it's, you can't, um, you, 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 if, if, if you put a wrong piece of information, then it could be fatal. For example, if you say that your blood type is O and it's actually A, then you might actually die in a hospital if somebody puts in the wrong type of information. So this is very, very sensitive information. And so it needs to really integrate all different stakeholders whenever any type of initiative is launched uh, with regards to biometric data. And this means consulting public consultations and expert roundtables, publishing consultation texts online, and allowing for comments from all interested parties with reasonable deadlines, providing feedback on received comments, and uh, in all stages, having meaningful participation with industry, NGOs, consumer groups, um, and that all of these consultations must be made public in, uh, in an accessible registry. So um, I hope that was sufficiently succinct, and uh, I will hand it back over to our moderator, Tim. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that was uh, immensely helpful, and um, already, I think, providing um, so much food for thought and guidance um, that we could now start a whole day workshop. Um, I, I think you, you, you brought up a, a importing, a very important points and one uh, in particular, you know, the anchoring it in, in, in um, international standards such as um, the necessary and proportionate principle. So the, the question um, that needs to be asked first is really, um, is um, the use, the collection, the storage, the processing of biometric data necessary and proportionate in the circumstances uh, um, we see? And I think from that point you can um, derive um, um, many other um, aspects, safeguards, etc. cetera. Um, do you uh, have thoughts that's for all of you um, in what cases do you think using biometric data is really beneficial, serves the purpose, is better than other solutions? And in what cases would you say it should really not be done? Just uh, an example of what uh, it uh, it's been authorized by the French DPA um, under the prior legislation. It's the um, system uh, for vocal authentication to uh, access of, um, of uh, a bank account, uh, for example, uh, because uh, uh, some um, measures uh, uh, have been um, uh, installed to uh, for the access for uh, the uh, constitution of uh, the babies, for example, uh, in um, of a benefit uh, uh, example of the use of this type of data uh, of France in the private sector. Um, maybe other. I think it's really difficult to um, list out, you know, situations where you can say it should or it shouldn't be. I think you really have to take each one on a case-by-case -case basis and assess. But general, I will say that you need to um, look at all, you know, look at the facts and circumstances of, like I said, with the Sasa one, for example, it did 
do a lot of good, but at the same time, a lot of bad happened in the process. So I think it's, it's not really white or black. You're going to have to look at each situation and see what needs to be done to protect rights, generally speaking. I don't think you can ever really say it's, in any particular case, it's always um, beneficial. There will always be dangers lurking. That's my opinion. Anyone else? Um, I think this was basically the core of the question that the Indian Supreme Court had to answer uh, in the case of the Aadhaar um, system. And uh, I agree that you know it, it has to be done on a case-by-case case basis. And I think that was the problem, that the system had just grown into such a large uh, you know, a thing that uh, it was difficult to separate uh, the different uses of the biometric data. And one, um, and of course, the, the court had to look into whether it's proportional. And one of the big things was also the fact that, you know, if you look at the way, um, if you have to enroll or the authentication of this uh, biometric data was done online to obtain welfare services. And uh, in a lot of rural parts of India, people did not have access to the internet and the technology that would allow them to enroll, which meant that people were getting excluded from the, the very systems that they, the welfare schemes that they were meant to benefit from. And the other problem with biometrics, um, for example, if you have fingerprints, a lot of people who engage in manual labor didn't really, don't, their fingerprints don't really function uh, for the purpose of authentication. It, it's not, it doesn't always register. So there were a lot of issues like this. And I think um, the question that the Supreme Court hasn't really addressed is whether there were any alternatives, I think that's the big question. Like whether you need to use biometric data to achieve the same end or not, whether any other form of identification is, in, is sufficient, whether this is the only way to do it is, like, is what we need to look at on a case-to-case -case basis. Thank you. Um, I uh, discovered Bernard Chen there from Microsoft, I don't know, you looked like you were about to leave, but um, <laughs> sorry for <laughs> pointing you out. Uh, Brett Smith, um, the president of Microsoft, has this summer um, been quite outspoken on, on facial recognition and the need to uh, do impact assessments and, and, and do and regulate this area. And that's linked to the discussion we have in here on in, in what circumstances uh, can technology like this be used and others not. Um, would you be willing um, to elaborate a little bit on how Microsoft sees uh, this? Thank you. Sure, Tim, my pleasure. I'll, because of the shortness of time, I'll, I'll make two high-level brief points. One is on government use of technology such as facial recognition, and secondly, what is the role of tech sector and tech companies. On government use, what Brad said in that blog post is that when it comes to sensitive use of technology such as uh, facial recognition, in democratic societies that are governed by rule of law, it really is the government's role to develop and enact the rules of the road as to how that should be used. For example, if the police are going to use facial recognition to sur conduct surveillance or law enforcement, it really is the government's job to uh, make sure that the right regulations are in place to regulate its own police. Uh, deferring to private companies in the tech sector to regulate the police or regulate the government, is, it's kind of a, a poor or inadequate substitute for that. It really is the government's role. Uh, but that's not to say, the second point I'm going to make is that that's not to say that tech sector and tech companies don't have a role. We do have a role. And the four, I would make four points. One is that the technology is still evolving, so we have responsibility to continue to improve the accuracy of the technology, reduce unfair bias. Secondly, we are trying to figure out what the principles are when it comes to providing this technology to all segments of the society, whether it be government or private enterprises, to use them. It's still, it's still new, and, and we're trying to figure that out, and uh, we're trying to get to a point where we can share some of our thoughts in a more public way. Uh, and because this is so new and evolving, we also said that we should move more deliberately and not rush into uses that could do, uh, could do damage and harm human rights. And lastly, in order to do all of that, we need to engage as tech sector, because uh, in, in two sense. One is 
as we're encouraging government to regulate itself, uh, we want to them to do so in an informed way, and we as tech companies who understand the technology have a role to help them inform them so that if they're going to regulate, it would be informed and thoughtful and effective regulation. And two, uh, one company has a limit as to what we can do, but if we uh, collaborate with other companies, peer companies, we can learn from each other and good practices, and also learn from other stakeholders such as civil society, acad academia, in forums such as this. So that would be my uh, thoughts on, on how tech sector and Microsoft look at this. Th thank you, thank you very much. Um, and um, I think it was quite fitting having this uh, reference to multi-stakeholderism. And um, I would, I know we are basically out of time, would give everyone 30 seconds to, uh, for a closing statement. And um, that was interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, just to, to, it's important to keep in mind maybe the first article of um, the Fran French national law, uh, which is uh, really important and um, which make uh, a lot of sense uh, in, the, in this matter, is that uh, informatics must be at the service of every citizen and that its development uh, must not interfere with human identity human rights, privacy, or individual or public uh, liberties. And I think it's really important to, to keep in mind uh, this uh, on, uh, on the matter uh, and on the context of the development of uh, a really um, inventive technologies and especially uh, when we, with the processing of uh, data biometrics. Okay, uh, just to quickly say that um, although in South Africa there is actually uh, a data protection law, um, there's a huge challenge on the continent in terms of um, the legal framework of, access of data protection, especially because the African Charter doesn't have a right to privacy in its, its, in its, um, in its provisions, and that has made it very difficult to get um, a human rights approach to data protection and privacy on the continent. Um, so I, I would say that that needs to be the starting point very few countries have laws on the continent, and even though countries that have laws on the continent are not really human rights focused, they don't look at the human rights issues that, that, are, that are pertinent. So I think a priority in Africa should be to find a way of incorporating um, somehow the right of privacy. There's a process of revising the Declaration of Principles, which supplements um, the freedom of expression provision in the African Charter. And that might be room to get privacy and data protection issues um, within the, the, the legal um, framework on the continent. Thank you. I'll just say very quickly that um, coming from the starting point that governments are going to install surveillance systems um, and other entities will be buying uh, surveillance technology, I think there's a, a very strong need for uh, international standards work that is audited or certifiable uh, such that those systems can be um, recognized for uh, meeting at least some of the standards in, embedded in various human rights principles, uh, you know, necessity, etc. Um, you know, there should be a standard and it, there should be a potential for certification so that customers can choose uh, to buy the more privacy protective option rather than the, le the less protective option. Plus one. Um, I completely agree with you. I just wanted to add two very brief things. Uh, we should move deliberately and slowly and purposefully on any types of programs that involve biometric data. We cannot move fast and break things. It's important to build them right because we're going to be using biometric data in the future. We're going to be seeing machine learning everywhere. We have to do it correctly. Um, and then two, I just wanted to say that whether we like it or not, multi-stakeholder, multi -stakeholder, the long word, is, is great, but we're still operating in silos. And the industry or a lot of private companies that are providing these types of technologies for governments, particularly with, with reading biometric data, um, operate in a completely different world. And we need to really start integrating that type of, uh, that viewpoint as well in all of these conversations. Thank you all.
um, I don't know if there's much left to add. I agree with everything that was said by everyone on the panel, but I just want to reiterate the need for uh, transparency and accountability systems to be built in, both, I think, in the development of technology as well as the law that accom accompanies it, uh, just to make sure that we, you know, as when we're go going slow, I think that's easier to do, and just to make sure that we don't have to end up in a situation where we're undoing things. And uh, yeah, that's what I have. So thank you. Th thank you so much, all of you. Um, that was hugely interesting for me. I hope for you too. Thank you for coming, staying with us. Um, I hope you took insights from this and food for thought. And um, I wish you a wonderful day. And uh, if you traveled, if I assume most of you did, then safe travels home. Bye. <laughs>